Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Father, we come before you. Lord, we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here in the house of God. Lord, we don't take it for granted that we get to come. We don't come to worship or, 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 or celebrate a celebrity. Lord, we don't come to uh, uh, come for tradition, but Lord, we come to worship you and to, to lift up the name of Jesus. And we come to acknowledge that Jesus is the leader of this church. And the, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask that your Holy Spirit tonight would be our teacher, would be our counselor, would lead us and guide us into your truth, into your principles. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us, Lord, as your word says that, uh, that, that we come for the equipping, Lord, that as we walk out of this building, Lord, that we might reflect your glory. Shine your goodness for a lost and dying world to see. Lord, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with and we, we acknowledge, God, we're so grateful that we are blessed in this house. God, we thank you that you would bless and we ask that you would bless all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ tonight and all throughout the week, Lord, our brothers and sisters, we don't ever think of ourselves as better, but Lord, we are co-laborers in the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom. Lord, we are all members of the same body, of the same family. Lord, we thank you that you would bless them as you have blessed us. And Lord, to you be the praise and the glory and the honor. To you be the, uh, uh, to your kingdom come and your will be done. Holy Spirit, speak to us tonight and part your word in our lives, Lord, that we might walk out and live it in Jesus' mighty name. We all said? Amen. Amen. Well, tonight I want to take a little, uh, 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 continue on a little bit further in our subject of the abundant life. Uh, last week we just had some fun, just, just, a, just an encouragement. I, I like to say it like this, it's a good old-fashioned Jesus message. You know, so often we come to church and we hear about what we need to do and, and what the Bible says about how to live our lives. But I love sometimes when we just take a moment to just look at what we have in Jesus. And we looked at the scriptures and we looked at one of the particular verses that Jesus was speaking to his disciples and now to you and I years later, thousands of years later. In John the 10th chapter, verse number 10, Jesus says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I love his words. He says, but I have come. He turns that around. He says, but I have come that you might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, they being his sheep, his followers, you and I. And I love how we looked at that word abundant, that, that word abundant literally means to have super abundance, supernatural abundance, overflowing, the Bible tells us, or abounding life. I don't know about you, I want abounding life. I don't want to just survive. I don't want to just exist you know, grow up and, and, and have a couple of kids and watch them grow up and then grow old and die and hopefully they... I don't want that. I want a life that means something. And so last week we looked at just some of the things about an abundant life, looking at what we have through Jesus Christ. And if you recall, we found that abundance only comes through Jesus. That we might find success in life apart from Jesus, in business or financially, in, in what we do or what we wear or, 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 or the people around us. We might see that as success, but we realize that abundance only comes from Jesus. We learn that joy is eternal, but happiness is temporal. So we, we live our lives in this pursuit of happiness, trying to find and to fill the emptiness of the inside with the latest gadget or the latest fad, but we realize that through Jesus Christ, we might have joy eternal or everlasting. We learned last week that we have been given, handed authority by Jesus Christ. But it's one of those things, authority is like one of those things where if you don't use it, you will never realize it and live in it. But we realize that we have the ability, the authority to walk out our lives, not having to quiver or to fear, but rather we saw the video, if you remember, anybody remember the video of that little tiny puppy chasing a big dog? Anybody remember that? Was anybody, was anybody here last week? I mean, you're all looking at me like, okay, all right. I'm like, I'm like is this Wednesday night? I don't know. I was tripping out for a minute. We learn that we have authority, but we have to, learn, we have to use it. And we learn that, that, that our, our life of abundance walks through faith because you don't always see the abundance that Jesus promises us right away. And we're going to continue right into that thought, right into looking into that, into the life of abundance. And, 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 and the Bible gives us so many different things. I mean, literally, we could talk about an abundant life for the rest of our lives because we could not chronicle or continue to, to keep all that Jesus has done for us. But today, I just want to take a look at a couple of things of an abundant life, some understanding, some principles that we've got to learn to walk in, to live in, and to understand and to see when we don't see it, an abundant life. And some things about you and I in our abundance in our lives. So today as we look into the Bible, I want you to look into the Word of God. I want you to turn with me to the book of John. You can, you can park there right there in the very first 
chapter of John because we'll start there. But we're just going to look at some things in John and then we'll move through the scriptures and just see about the abundance of life. But some of the things and some of the understandings of an abundant life that we have through Jesus Christ, I love this, is that we are now found. We're no longer lost. You see, an abundant life is no longer lost. So often I hear about people say, you know, I, 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 this is what happened in my life. I, I lost my job or, or my career or I was married for X amount of years. Uh, this was going on. I grew up and I was a stay-at-home mom and now my kids are all gone and I don't know what to do anymore and we feel lost. Has anybody ever been physically lost like you don't know where you were, right? Isn't it amazing that, that the feeling of, of, of separation when you're lost? Your world gets so much smaller. I remember uh, a couple of, uh, uh, it was about a year ago, I believe, a year ago or so, my family, we were all at Disneyland. I think I've told the story before, but we were all at Disneyland on a family outing, and all the little kids were out there, and there's this little thing where they take lightsabers, and they teach little kids how to be Jedis, and all the kids wanted to go watch it. And so my little boy Bjorn, he was three at the time, he says, I want to go with everybody. So we said, we'll go with all your cousins, and all the cousins were sitting over there, and he wanted to watch this Jedi training academy. Well, unbeknownst to me, unbeknownst to my, 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 my sister, Jessica, who was watching them at the time, or took the kids, really, more than anything, he didn't want to go there anymore. And so she said, okay, go right over there. Daddy's right here. I mean, literally, like, from me to the front row. That's where we were. But as he walked to the front row, he, he got lost. He got turned around. And, and we didn't know. I didn't know. My wife, she says, i got to go to the bathroom. You know, of course. It's right when, when she's got to go to the bathroom. She's like, baby, got him? I'm like, yeah, I got this. Come on, you can trust dad. So mom's gone. I'm sitting there. And all of a sudden, I see the security guard walking with his little kid. Oh, no, just my heart was broken. I said, oh, man, that poor little kid. <laughs> he was just crying, like wailing. You know that, real, that wailing, just, just, just going to town, wailing. And I just thought, oh, that poor little. My heart was broken as a parent. I just thought, man, I, that was so sad. And all of a sudden, I looked over, and it was my kid. <laughs> Literally jumped over a bush, grabbed him, picked him up, and I was just holding him and, you know, got the lecture from the security guard about not losing your kids, and then mom came, and Bjorn's crying, and, and it's like, I leave for one minute, and this is what happens. And, but, you know, I remember I, I grabbed him, and, and I just held him, and I just told him, I says, I'll never let you go. I'll never let you go. And it's funny, because we, we had passes at the time, and we let them expire, and so we hadn't been to Disneyland in a long time, and we took our interns uh, here at the Rock Church World Outreach, and we took our interns to Disneyland just last Monday just to say thank you and to, to conclude their internship in the next couple of months. And uh, I lost him again. <laughs> but it was only for like a second. But that feeling of being lost, there's nothing like it. After, after I went and I found him, he didn't even realize he was lost. He was just walking with one other friend, but dad lost him this time. And I went and grabbed him and I wrote my, I wrote my phone number on his arm just in case, you know. Just... <laughs> but just that feeling of being lost, that feeling of not knowing where your security comes from, that feeling of not knowing where, where, where everybody's at. You know, my little boy, I remember when he was crying, I mean, it just broke my heart to see that he felt like mom and dad were gone. And you see, when we walked about our lives, before Jesus Christ, we lived lost, aimless. You know, seeking every wind or every new fad, every new diet, every new business, every new scheme, every new device, every new social. I mean, it's like every week there's some new challenge on social media to do this and do this and, and do this and for this cause. And, and we're just like Forrest Gump. You remember Forrest Gump? Remember the feather just kind of floating around and that feather was symbolic of our lives. Just kind of, you never know where you're going to go. Life's like a box of chocolates, right? We live lost. But you see, the truth is, is that because of Jesus Christ, Jesus says, I have come to give you an abundant life. I have come to give you life. Because of Jesus Christ, we no longer have to live lost in our lives. As a matter of fact, the very first verses of the book of John talk about Jesus. It tells us that Jesus was in the beginning. He was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But looking at verse number 4, in John, the first chapter, it says, In Him was life, Jesus, and His life was the light of men. 
Verse number five, he goes on and he says, and the light shines in the darkness. Could not comprehend it. The, the, the devil didn't know. Humanity was blinded by our own search. Couldn't understand it, but then all of a sudden, out of nothing, the light, boom, shines on humanity. Darkness could not comprehend it. Verse number nine tells us that. Oh, you don't have verse number nine. Okay. Verse number nine says that the light was a true light, which gives every light to man coming into this world. So Jesus is the true light. He is the light. I think of Jesus. He's like that lighthouse. Our lives are a storm. The waves are crashing. Everything's going wrong, it seems like. It seems like sometimes nothing goes right. Sometimes maybe you're in a season where everything's going right, and that's great. But you've been there. You'll be there at some point, you know. But there it is, Jesus, the lighthouse on the rocks, guiding us, directing us, telling us, hey, don't go this way, go this way. Don't go here, go there. You see, we no longer have to walk about like we don't know where we're doing. That life has a, a, a meaningless reason floating around, but you see, now we're no longer lost because an abundant life has purpose. Yes. An abundant life has reason. An abundant life has fulfillment. Amen. Maybe you were a mom and your children are gone. Your life has a purpose, Jesus. Maybe your parent raising infants right now, your life has a purpose beyond just parenting, Jesus. Maybe your business professional where your job, your life is dedicated to your career, your life has a purpose, Jesus. Maybe you're retired beyond living in the golden years of your life, your life has a purpose, Jesus. And we no longer have to walk about blind, no longer have to walk about in the dark, groping as though we might feel something. Why? Because we are no longer lost, we are found. Jesus tells us in, the, in, in John the 12th chapter, tells his disciples, listen, I'm only going to be with you guys for a while. While I'm with you, walk in the light. Can you put that scripture up? Walk in the light while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. Why? Because he who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. You've probably heard the story. I've told it like four or five times. I remember when I went hiking one time, and we it went way late. We were hiking up in the mountains, went up to one of the tall mountains up here in California, overestimated, got lost. And there it was, 9 o'clock at night, in the woods, lost, lost. Not like not knowing, like literally, we decided stupidly to not go on the trail. I, I, I know a shortcut, Bear Grylls said, follow the water, it'll take you to civilization. Lost. I'll tell you, man, in the darkness at night, not knowing which direction to go, not having a flashlight, but just a little keychain flashlight, your mind, your world closes in on you. And that's sometimes what life can feel like. Confusion, anxiety, depression sets in, all sorts of different, different. One, what about this, what about this, what was that I heard? What is this that's going on? What's around the corner of my life? I don't know, I just can't understand, I don't know how to live with it or cope with it, but Jesus says, listen, I'm the light, the lighthouse of your life, the guiding beacon in which you will always know in which direction to travel. Like the psalmist says in 119, your word is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my path. The Bible tells us in Ephesians in the, in the fifth chapter, verse number eight, that we are no longer children of darkness. Church, you are no longer walking in the darkness of life if you have Jesus Christ. God is not a God of confusion. God's every bit of his desire in your life is for you to have a purpose and to know that purpose. All you have to do is trust and ask, seek, and knock. And God will direct your ways. God told Abraham, go to a land that I will show you. I didn't show you. I will show you. But listen, that man followed God. And he was blessed. The father of many nations. Why, church? Because we're no longer lost. If you don't know what to do with your life, it's time for you to get a hold of the purpose of your life. And we all have something in common. That purpose is Jesus. We were created to glorify, to exalt, to lift up the name of Jesus. There are people in your world that need to know that name. There are people in your life that need to hear that name. Your purpose is Jesus. What can you do to live your purpose? An abundant life is no longer lost. An abundant life is found like my boy 
when he was crying, and I grabbed him, and I, hit, I gave him a hug, and I told him, I said, man, your big hugs warm my heart. Now he always wants to say, Dad, you look cold. And he gives me these big, deep hugs. See, that's exactly God for you, an abundant life. Grasp in the arms of your Savior, of God Almighty. He says, I want you with me. You don't have to be lost. You are no longer lost. You are found. An abundant life God gives to us through Jesus Christ. God supplies our needs. I love that. In an abundant life, we are sustained by God. This can often be a point of frustration, if, if I can be honest with you. When it comes to an abundant life, you hear preachers say, God will supply all of your needs. Somebody said amen. <laughs> Some of us are like, I'm waiting for that. I'm still waiting. Hallelujah. And sometimes it can be a point of frustration for us because the Bible tells us that God supplies all of our needs, that God is our providence, that God is our provider. But yet sometimes it doesn't feel like it. And the reason is, is that oftentimes we can get wrapped up in the trap of comparison. That we look and we, we begin to realize and we say, well, God, your word says that you'll supply all of my needs. And then we look to the left and we say, but my life doesn't look like them. God, you, you said that you supply all my needs, but this isn't going on over here, but it's going on for them. God, you said you'd supply all my needs. You'd be my sustenance. You'd be my provider. But I don't look like them. So we get wrapped up in this trap of comparison. And it's so easy to look on the other side of the fence and see that the grass is greener. But listen, let me tell you something. God has a desire for you. His desire is to care for you, to nurture you, to provide for you, to lead you, to guide you, to sustain you in all that you do through him. In the book of Deuteronomy, in the 8th chapter, Deuteronomy in the 8th chapter, Moses is recounting to the people of Israel, he's recounting the story of the Exodus as, as, as it's coming to a conclusion, and he's, this is his great sermon, this book. And he says, so he, God, humbled you, allowing you to hunger, fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Manna literally means, what is it? So he says, God gave you the opportunity to trust in him, in his provision, and he gave you food that you didn't know. That he might, that, that he might make you know that the men shall not live by bread alone. I love how Jesus quotes that when the devil's tempting him for the second half of that verse. But man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. I love that. And you know, sometimes it's so easy to overlook the simple things in life. The provision of God. But God, your word says that you're providing for me, but I don't see this. God, your word says that you'll provide for me, but I don't see this. God, your word says that you'll provide my healing, but I haven't seen it yet. God, your word says that you'll be my sustenance, but I haven't seen that yet. God, your word says don't worry about this and don't worry about that, but seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you, but I haven't seen that yet. And it's so easy to miss the little things in life. And I like how it goes on in the second or the, the fourth verse. He says, your garments did not wear out, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Think about that for a moment. Not only did God provide their food, their sustenance, their water when they didn't have it, he gave it to them. That's big stuff right there, right? Food and water, big deal. But even the little things, your clothes for 40 years did not get tattered. Your feet did not swell as you walked every day. One of the things I really like to do is I like to hike. In hiking, walking with weight on your shoulders, your feet swell up to two sizes. Two sizes! So you can imagine at the end of the day, that's why your feet hurt. If you walk on your feet all day long, you probably feel it. You say, my dogs are barking. Here he's saying, your clothes never wore out and your dogs never were barking. It's so easy to overlook the little things in life. You see, there's always a reason to grumble. Have you ever noticed that? There's always something that happens in life, something that's going on, something that's, that somebody said or somebody did or, or, or the politicians are doing or it's happening on the other side of the world. There's always a reason in life to grumble. But when we choose to focus and we choose to look and we choose to realize and we choose to accept life of abundance, we realize, God, will provide all of our needs. That God will be our provider. He will lead us, like the Bible tells us, beside still waters. 
Like the 23rd Psalm says, it tells us all of us, the first number five tells us that he has prepared a table in the presence of his enemies, that, his, that you anoint my head with oil. He says, my cup runs over. Psalm says, never have I seen the righteous forsaken of the Lord. You see, God's desire for you and I is to be our provision. But we've got to learn to trust in him, to, to be led by him. I remember I was out, my wife, I've told the story before too, it's not the first time I've told the story, but I remember I was out with my wife and we were out camping. I, it was a big deal. If you know me, I get really wound up. Vacations for the first three days are horrid. Is anybody, can anybody relate? Any of the men, maybe in the men in the house, you've got to plan it, you've got to pack, right? Anybody, nobody? Really? Anybody? Like... Man, i got to know the plan, all right? So we had it all booked out, drove eight hours to Yosemite, only to find out that the campsite that I booked for that night, I had actually booked the week before. <laughs> looking for my name, it's like one o'clock in the morning. One o'clock in the morning, I'm looking for my name and like what campsite I'm supposed to go to, and I don't see it, so I pull out my phone, I pull out the reservation papers that I had printed out, and I'm like, I realized that was when the moment, you, you would think before you leave for an eight-hour trip, you would look at that. I booked the site a week before. I'm just praying, God, what do I do? I've got, I've got a baby. Literally, Emma was not even a year old. Bjorn was two years old. I've got a baby. We've been in the car for eight hours, packed up in my truck. There's nowhere to go. It's two o'clock in the morning. I'm asking my wife, do we just sleep on the side of the... Where do we do? Right then, right then, at that moment, a young man drives up in a Honda Civic, and he says, hey, you guys need a campsite? <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, man. I got a campsite. I'm not even going to stay here for the night. My campsite number is this, blah, 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 blah. Go stay there for the night. Drives out of the park. Never see him again. You see, God provides. God provides. His desire is for you to trust in him, to lean on him. Matthew, in the 22nd chapter, you can read it later on. I'll just tell you a story. Jesus gives a parable of the wedding feast. He says there was a wedding feast. The master prepares, prepares a feast. And he invites everybody, but everybody gives an excuse as to why not to come out. But he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And he says, go out to the highways and the byways and bring them all in. But I love this, how he prepares, or he, Jesus in his parable in Matthew the 22nd, equates the kingdom of God to a banquet. And you know why it's so important that we understand that he equates the kingdom of God to a banquet? Because he doesn't equate the kingdom of God to a restaurant. Where you go... And you pay for your service. He doesn't equate the kingdom of God to a potluck dinner where you go and you bring your part. He equates the kingdom of God to a banquet. You've been to the wedding. You know it. You're like, man, free dinner tonight. <laughs> now, this is, this is the Inland Empire, right? When there's a wedding out, you don't need breakfast. You don't need lunch. Why? Because it's all free. Then you're going to help yourselves. And Jesus is talking about this wedding feast. You see, the kingdom of God is like a banquet. You show up and you are served. You don't have to bring the money for the bill. You don't have to bring the dish. All you got to do is show up, Jesus says, and enjoy the feast. God wants you to show up in the kingdom of God. He says, let me take care of the rest. God's desire for us, church, is to be our provision. And we've got to learn to see beyond what's not happening. They didn't find the promised land. That was what was not happening for 40 years. But what was happening is they were being fed. They were being led. They were, their clothes didn't wear out. Their feet didn't swell. Everything they needed, God had. Why? Because what God promises on, he delivers. And if through Jesus Christ says, I have come to give you abundant life, part of that abundant life is the sustenance and sustaining and the providence of God. That is providence. An abundant life through Jesus Christ. Man, I love this one. An abundant life cannot keep silent. Think about that for a moment. Abundant life, you, you just you can't keep silent. I remember I went to this restaurant up in Bishop. I was up in Bishop uh, with my brother-in-law. We were staying up there in, in the dead of winter. And there was this barbecue joint called Holy Smokes. <laughs> we drove by it a couple times. I thought the name was cool, Holy Smokes. I, mean, I thought that was kind of cool, right? Texas barbecue. So, oh, let's try it out. We got there. When I walked in, they said to me, after I, after I bought my dinner, they said, God bless you. I, thought, I knew I liked this place. 
And then all of a sudden we're sitting there and all of a sudden I realize over the, over the intercom, they're playing Hillsong music. I'm like, man, I knew that Holy Smokes was something different than just barbecue. <laughs> that was great. Then they brought out the food and it was amazing. You know what? For the first time, I'm not the kind of person that tells people things. I'm a very quiet, introverted type person. I'd rather just kind of keep to myself. My brother-in-law and I, both and I, we, we were so impressed by this that we both logged on to one of those social, we created accounts on one of those social media sites that you leave reviews. Normally you only do that for bad reviews. We, we, we were like, this place is so good that we have to create an account and tell everybody we know, you need to come all the way to Bishop to Holy Smokes Barbecue. They're closed on Monday nights. You need to come all the way to Holy Smokes. <laughs> but that was for a barbecue joint. How much more than for Jesus? Who took us from a life of being lost living in darkness with no reason or no purpose or no motivation in life and now all of a sudden pulled us out of the condition that we were in and restored us, redeemed us, sanctified us, washed us as white as snow. Now let me tell you something. A barbecue joint's got nothing on Jesus Christ. That's why I so, I so admire my mother, Pastor Deborah, because she's a fireball. She comes up here, that, man, I'll tell you, she's preaching this weekend, just, just a little heads up, all right? Y'all better show up. But she just lays it down. Such a passion for Jesus. I mean, uh, dad, dad, dad goes like this. He goes, true story, okay? That's, that's what Pastor Jim does. Whenever he tells a story, he goes, true story. Watch, all right? Now that I told you, watch. That's how my mom is, no matter where you go. We'll be outside watching a movie, and there she is, she's crying. God is so good. Jesus is so good. <laughs> Disneyland. Great moments with Mr. Lincoln right as you walk in. Like the most boring thing at Disneyland. There she is. Oh, God is so good. <laughs> Jesus. Abraham. She loves God so much. But here's the thing. She loves God so much that she can't keep quiet. Yeah. I get on an airplane. I go like this. It's like, it's like men in the bathroom, Right? If I got a window seat, then good. I get to move my neck a little bit. <laughs> if she gets on an airplane, it's not three minutes before she knows that person's life story and she's telling them about Jesus. I see, I mean, we're at the mall and she's hugging somebody. Why? Because no, where, no matter where she goes, she can't keep silent. Because God is so good. And God has done so much. Like Pastor Jim talks about, like my mom, I hear the stories of my mom. When he met her, she bit her fingernails and she was quiet. She hid behind him. But now here's this powerful woman of God because God has so transformed her into an abundant life that she can no longer keep silent. But she has to tell somebody about Jesus. Church, we got to develop a zeal and an excitement for Jesus Christ to tell ourselves, hey, listen, it is worth telling somebody about Jesus in our lives. Are you with me today? I had you go to John. Go with me to John in the fourth chapter now. John in the fourth chapter is the story of a woman. She's there at the well. Jesus is there. He's, he's thirsty. It's in the middle of the day. Very few people go at this time of the day, at this time of, of, the, uh, of history. In the heat of the day, very few people were out. Here he is in the middle of the day. The sun's high in the sky and he's going to the well to get water and this woman comes with her jug and he says, Fetch me some water. And the woman says, well, why are you talking to me? You're a Jew. I'm a, uh, I'm a Samaritan. You're a man. I'm a woman. There's like so many reasons why you shouldn't talk to me. And Jesus begins a dialogue with her. And he tells her, he says, I've got this water for you. That if you drink it, you'll never thirst again. And she says, oh, I want this water. And he begins to, to, to tell her all about her life. You've heard the story about the woman at the well. He tells her, that, you know, you've had five husbands. or You've had five husbands. The man you're with is not with. You're not even your husband right now. And he begins to read her mail. And so amazing what happens is she goes back to the town and she tells everybody, you've got to come to the well. You've got to come to the well. You've got, there's a guy at the well right now you need to see. And so the whole town, the Bible tells us in John, the fourth chapter, the whole town comes out and it says, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed because, listen to this, because the word of the woman who testified. You see, Jesus could have told her about the living water. Jesus could have told her about salvation. Jesus could have told her about that, and she could have gone home and stayed silent about it, but rather she went and told everybody about it, and they came and believed because of her testimony. The Bible says that he spoke many things 
and that they believe because of her and they believe because of the words that he said. You see, our testimony carries so much weight. Don't ever miss an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you know that you don't have to evangelical, evangelize? Evan, evangelize. Thank you. Hello. I went to college, believe it or not. Did you know that you can't evangel? You don't have to evangelize? You don't have to have a three-point message to tell somebody about Jesus. Just in your conversations, try to throw in the words God, Jesus, grace, faith, salvation, when it's a good thing. I remember my neighbor, she was talking about fear, and I just, you know, I don't remember what happened, but my neighbor, I was just talking about this man, by the grace of God, through Jesus Christ. I'm not afraid. I don't have to be afraid. She's like, how do you not be afraid of, of burglars or of this? And it's just like, I've got, I've got, the Bible tells me, using the words Bible, Jesus, God, grace. I didn't have to sit there and, hey, listen, sit down. Okay, listen, I, I need to tell you, you're sin, you're sinning, all right? You need to get saved. Uh, but Jesus told me to go, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to tell you all. I, I didn't do that. Just simply sharing. I was sitting at a campfire with a friend, sharing what God has done in my life. Later on that, later on that week, that guy went into a church and got saved. You see, don't miss an opportunity in your life to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because your story, like that woman at the well, your story of your abundant life because of what Jesus has done for you is oftentimes the most effective way to get somebody to know Jesus because you have abundant life. Don't miss out. You got to stir yourself up. Sometimes you don't feel like it. Paul the Apostle tells Timothy, his young protege, he says, man, stir up the gift that's on the inside of you. I told you that my wife and I, we snuck into a couple churches. When pastors go to other churches, here's what we do. We sit in the back row, and we want to see everything. I want to, I'm looking at what the ushers are doing. I'm watching the music. I'm watching the lights, and I'm looking at I want to see. I want to know everything. We wanted to go to the churches and sit in the back row, but then yet my wife looks to a woman, and she starts talking, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to talk. I just want to be facing the crowd today. She starts talking, she starts talking. All of a sudden, sure enough, at this church, she went to our Bible college. Yeah. She's like, you're Pastor Jim's son? It's like, yeah. I preach at the church now. I'm the pastor. That... Really? And it's like, man, I had to stir myself up. Why? Because I went with the full intentions of sitting in the back of the church, observing everything. She brought me down to the front row with my wife, and we sat on the front row, and we had to be on, and we had to engage in conversation. I had to stir myself up. Because I'm an introvert, believe it or not. I don't want to talk. I want to go home. Be by myself. But Paul tells Timothy, stir yourselves up. Stir yourselves up. He, says, he tells him, hey, preach. Be, be in season. Be ready in season and out. Preach the gospel. Be ready to do whatever God has called you to do. The gospel is your life. What Jesus has done for you. You are a walking testament of the power of God. Why? Because you have abundant life through Jesus Christ. You might find success in the world, but you can only find abundance through Jesus. Happiness might be momentarily, but joy is eternal because of Jesus. You don't have to walk afraid of what the world might have because you've been given authority because of Jesus. You walk out every day in faith in abundance because of Jesus. You are no longer lost in life because of Jesus. You have been given everything you need to succeed and to live and to breathe and to have your being because of Jesus. And now, because of Jesus, you cannot keep silent, but you must tell somebody through your life what God has done for you. Guys, in conclusion, listen, the grass might always seem greener. It will always seem greener on the other side. Literally at my house, it is greener. <laughs> but you don't know what they go through to get that grass. My neighbor pays a lot more for his lawn than I do. I don't know if that's my neighbor. That might be my neighbor. <laughs> Guys, don't get wrapped up in the comparison game of thinking that abundant life only comes because you look like so-and-so over here, because you have this over here, because you look like that over there. The Bible, tells you, the Bible tells us, God says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper, for you to succeed. God has a desire for you. Don't get wrapped up. The Bible tells us, talking about giving, but talking about you and I, that all, my, all grace might abound towards us, abound towards you, that, my, that you might be uh, have abundance for every good work. Listen, guys, 
you have an abundant life because of Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus Christ, we live an abundant life. And let's remember that each and every day, not look at the reasons to grumble, not look at the reasons to complain, not look at the reasons to be frustrated. Hey, I had to live that one today. But to look at Jesus. Because through Jesus, we have abundance. Imagine what this world would look like if every Christian recognized and walked in the abundance that Jesus has given to us. What could we not accomplish for the name of Jesus? It's time for us to change our world, to turn it upside down for the glory of God by recognizing that we have an abundant life through Jesus Christ. Did you guys get something out of the Word of God today? Hey, listen, before we leave today, I'm going to take just a couple of minutes just to invite you to accept the life that we've talked about. You see, it would be a shame for us to leave under the pretenses that everybody's okay with God when the truth is there are people in this room right now that are not. So I'm just going to ask you, I promise I'm not going to take much more of your time. I'll go, I'll go quickly through it today. But if you're in this place today and you, you feel like, well, I think, I hope, I, I, I want to go to heaven. Did you know that there's nowhere in the Bible that says that because you think or hope that you're right with God that you're going to get to heaven? Or that because your parents told you that you were a Christian growing up or you were baptized or christened as a baby? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend church or you volunteer. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it even say that because you're a good person, because you stand for social justice or because you, you help out your fellow human being, that, that puts you in the right position with God so that you can have eternal life and life with God. You see, nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven, to be right with God and right standing with God. Why? Because the Bible tells us that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So no matter what we do, we can't earn it, we can't buy it, we don't deserve it, we can't work hard for it. The only thing we can do is accept the gift of God, eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. You see, the, the reality is, is that sometimes it's hard for us to understand, sometimes it's hard for us to comprehend, but the truth of the matter is, is that we're all just one virus, we're all just one incident, we're all just one epidemic away from meeting our Creator. And the Bible is very clear what happens when we die. There's one of two options, heaven or hell. And you've been given the decision. So often it's hard to believe, well, I don't know about heaven, I don't know about hell, I haven't seen her, I haven't, ex I haven't experienced it. Listen, you know it's real. Just because you can't see it or because you haven't felt it doesn't mean it's not real. Just like the radio waves going from me to the sound booth, you can't see them, but yet you know that they exist because you can hear the sound of my voice through the speakers. Heaven's a real place, real enough for Jesus to teach us about it, real enough for the word of God to be preserved over thousands of years for us to take it serious today. I want to encourage you today. You can't get to heaven based on your own devices can't get to heaven based on your religious or ceremonial traditions. The only way you can get to heaven is God's way, and that's through Jesus. Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. He says these words, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you are born again in John, the third chapter. What does born again mean? Well, it's not what Hollywood and society's made it out to be. Simply put, born again means this. It means that you've given all of your heart, you've given God all of your life to, to God through Jesus Christ. It's an all or nothing relationship. Jesus, in the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, he's speaking to the church, listen, to you and I. It's the final plea in the word of God for us to take this serious. He says, you think you're rich, you think you're wealthy, but you don't realize how naked and destitute you really are. And in his plea, he says to the church, I'm coming back, and I come. when I come, I'd rather find that you're hot or I'd rather find that you're cold. Because he goes on and he says, because if I find that you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. And a shocking statement. And what Jesus is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. And they'll be expelled, ejected from the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be lukewarm in your relationship with God? It simply means that you've got your ups and your downs and your ins and your outs. Your occasional church attendance, token prayer, doing some of your own things some of, but, and, and, not, and some of God's thing. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. Listen, if that's you today, I love you enough, I respect you enough today to tell you the truth. You can't hope, you can't wish, you can't want, you can't uh, uh, have enough religious tradition in your life. You can't coast your way through this and expect at the end of your life to be okay with God. God says, I want it all. And the reason is, is that because God gave for us Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, Jesus, to die a beaten, bloody mess on a cross, despised, to, to have our sin and our shame cast upon him for our redemption. In return, he wants our hearts, he wants our lives. You see, it's not so much just about what happens when you die like we read today. Jesus says, I have come to give you life that you might have it more abundant." You might be in this place today, you might be empty on the inside. Wandering, like we talked about, lost in the darkness. Trying to fill the void of your life with everything you can think of, but nothing fills the emptiness. And the reason is, is that's a God-sized hole that only God can fill through Jesus Christ. 
The Bible tells us that the gift of God is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. It's a gift. And like any gift, you have to choose to accept it or reject it. God's not going to kick down the doors of your life. He's not going to force his way or make his way. He's not a manipulator or connive his way in. You've got to choose. And today I want to give you that choice, to give you that opportunity. Jesus says these words. He says that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you. He says, but if you deny him, he'll deny you. The choice, the decision is yours and yours alone to make. Today I'm going to give you that opportunity. I'm going to do this on the count of three. I'll count to three. I'll go one, two, and then on the count of three I'll go three. And I'll smack my hands together real loud just like that. And when I do, I'm going to ask you to do something real bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. You see, by the raising of your hand, what you're doing is you're making the decision. You're saying today, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. It's your choice. Your decision today. Who should raise their hands? If you've never given God your heart, you've never given God your life. If that's you, in just a moment, get ready. Today is the day of your salvation. The perfect time is now. Who should raise your hands? If you've been living lukewarm, don't leave today without making sure. If you're not sure, don't walk out of here without making sure. Maybe you did this as a child or at a harvest crusade or you prayed that prayer once long ago, but you've never really followed through with it. Listen, if that's you in this place today, come on. In just a moment, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Who should raise your hands? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. Been running from God instead of to God. If that's you, listen. Let's quit playing games. Let's quit messing around. It's time to walk in the abundant life that you have been given through Jesus Christ. And it starts by making the decision to accept Jesus into your life. Hands are already going up. I see you guys. So if that's you in this place, I'm going to count to three. And when I do, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Hands are already going up. If that's you in this place, get ready. When you do, I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Be proud about this. What you're doing is you're saying, I want to give God my heart. I want to give God my life. You ready? From the front to the back, from the side to side. If that's you in this place, get ready. This is your moment. This is your time. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. I got you. One over there. Two, three, four. I got you guys right over there. Four wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Four wise people. Five. I got you right over here. Five wise people. Anybody else? You say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. If that's you in this place today, you say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. This is your moment. This is your time to accept life through Jesus Christ in this house today. Anybody else today? I got you. All right, cool. Six. Hey, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. This is your moment. This is your time to make that decision today. Six wise people. Anybody else today? Well, hey, praise God for six wise people. Amen. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're out of time. I've already preached too long. I said I was going to preach short, and I lied. But here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, I want all of you that raised your hands, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you should have. If you say, man, that's me. I, I should have done that. You don't get saved. You say, I'm making the decision. With every decision comes action, and we're going to do that together. We're going to follow through together. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by giving your life to Jesus Christ, and we're going to do that together right here, right now. So if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Bring your family with you. I don't care. That's cool. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Get into the aisle. Come meet me right here at this altar. We're going to change destinies together. So let's all stand. Nobody leave at this time. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, if that's you in this place, wherever you're at, you guys, you come and come meet me up here. Let's change destinies together. Come on, if that's you in this place. You're all I need. Right on, my man. Take all these pieces and down the key. Then look down inside. See what you see. Know that I love you from the deepest part of me. You're all my life. You're all I need. Praise God, you guys came. And I'll tell you what, I want, to, I want to share something cool. You are making the very best decision you can make. I mean, that's cool, right? I mean, that, that says you're smart. Good job. Here's what I want to do. I want to tell you a couple things. First, I want to tell you you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration, all right? So you don't have to wipe that frown upside down. You know, they say it like that. You're going to get saved. You're going to be born again. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel, all right? Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. He's going to take you guys just right over there. He's, all he's going to do, I'll tell you, nothing weird goes on. I'm as weird as it gets, all right? Here's what he's going to do. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by inviting Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, okay? What does that mean, Lord and Savior? The leader of your life. You're going to invite him to be the leader of your life. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information, some real easy reading, so that when you walk out of this place, you say, what do I do next? We're going to help point you in the right direction. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back to hang out with us. We want you to hang out with us. We want to get you connected here at church with a friend. Somebody will meet with you before church. 
They'll buy a cup of coffee or some french fries or something like that if you come on a weekend. They'll sit with you for just a couple of weeks. You're not joining some big, long program. Just to teach you some things about the Word of God so that you get strong in the ways of God and you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in everything that God has in store for you. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.